uh, and I would like to compliment the Institute for the initiative in organizing uh, this event on a topic which uh, unfortunately seems to be uh, lower and lower on the radar screen and uh, less and less importance attached to it. I hope uh, I can, uh, in my presentation, prove that uh, the contrary is important. Um, so there are two uh, in main interlocking messages uh, that define this year's uh, European Commission uh, reports as well as its uh, proposed enlargement strategy, which was uh, presented uh, just a month ago uh, in uh, Brussels. Uh, and there are two very uh, important messages. Uh, the first one is uh, the importance of maintaining the credibility in the enlargement process. The second uh, message uh, is maintaining the momentum in the process itself. I would say that the first message, uh, maintaining the credibility, is probably the most difficult one for two reasons, and it has two angles. First of all, uh, the importance of ensuring that in the candidate countries themselves uh, there is a, a continued effort to pursue effective and meaningful reforms in order to fulfill the uh, criteria set for accession. And secondly, uh, the importance of ensuring continued support within the EU member states and public opinion uh, on enlargement and uh, the importance of fostering a debate that will demonstrate the benefits that have already accrued from uh, the enlargement policy of the, uh, of the European Union over the past years, particularly as regards economic uh, development, but also as regards political stability, <laughs> extending the frontiers of peace and security to include uh, more uh, and more uh, countries. And to quote just one quote from the, uh, the uh, strategy that was adopted by the European Commission, it says, all enlargement countries have a clear European perspective. Progress towards membership depends on the steps taken by each country to meet the established criteria based on the principles of its own merits. This is crucial for the credibility of the enlargement policy and for providing incentives to the countries to pursue far-reaching uh, reforms. At the same time, it goes on to say, it is essential for member states together with the EU institutions to lead an informed debate on the political, economic and social impact of the uh, enlargement policy. Th they have a key role in providing citizens with the facts on enlargement policy and in so doing to inform them of the benefits, including its major contribution to peace, security and prosperity and to address any concerns they may have. This, I feel, is becoming more uh, and more difficult. And even if we have many examples of the positive benefits uh, that have accrued from enlargement for the European Union, there is no denying the decrease uh, in support for enlargement uh, within the European Union. On the one hand, you have a number, in a number of member states, governments uh, who hesitate to uh, give vocal expression uh, to its support for enlargement for fear of alienating voters, particularly before uh, elections. Uh, and on the other hand, you have also the rise of populist parties who equate uh, enlargement with uh, increased levels of immigration. And this is likely uh, to increase, unfortunately, during the course of next year when we have the uh, the European Parliament elections where the loudest voices will probably be the extremist voices regarding the dangers of uh, enlargement being equated uh, with more uh, immigration uh, into uh, the European Union. This is, in my view, a short-sighted uh, approach uh, which will only serve to uh, weaken the European Union's uh, transformative power and would also have serious implications for the Western Balkan countries themselves, because a, a diminishing prospect uh, of uh, EU accession would dilute uh, that uh, power of the European Union for much-needed reforms, and it would also fuel nationalist, populist agendas 
in uh, some of the uh, countries, particularly the Western Balkan countries, where uh, the situation remains fragile, in particular Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia. So uh, I think this is also, interestingly, one of the important messages that came out from the uh, conference that was uh, hosted by the Department of Foreign Affairs and the IIEA informally at the end of May uh, on the 10 years of the Thessaloniki <coughs> agenda, which, as you know, set out the European perspective for the uh, Balkan region. And at that conference informally, there were several personalities who emphasized the importance of the enlargement policy, not least uh, the then Minister for European Integration, Lucinda Crichton, who made very clear that were the EU to withdraw its prospect of membership, it would lose, and I quote, one of its most effective tools for promoting peace, democracy, and prosperity in Europe. So if we look at uh, this year's uh, enlargement package, uh, we will see that it does reflect the need and the importance of maintaining credibility, but also the importance of maintaining the momentum. It emphasizes the accession process as being more rigorous uh, and more comprehensive than in the past, and of course it has become more complicated. I think Tony uh, Brown uh, has some interesting statistics about comparing the uh, enlargement <coughs> negotiations when we joined uh, in 1973 with current enlargement process and how difficult it has become. Uh, in the uh, overall report uh, of the Commission, it sets out five key challenges which reflect those areas where major reforms are still required in the candidate countries. First of all, economic governance and competitiveness. There, of course, uh, there is still a major challenge of trying to ensure legal certainty for business and economic operators in those countries. A legal certainty which in many of the countries does not exist because of political interference, because of public procurement policies that are not being respected, public procurement standards that are not being respected because of political uh, interference, and also uh, because uh, public uh, financial management is, remains uh, very weak. And similarly, in the same context, uh, there is the enormous challenge of the unemployment rates. If you look at Macedonia itself, over 30% unemployment, the majority of which are young people, uh, and it does emphasize the importance of priorities uh, of, in terms of spending by uh, the individual countries themselves and what the European Union can do to offer in terms of advice and encouragement. In that context also, I would uh, highlight the role of the Regional Cooperation Council based in Sarajevo, which was established precisely to promote uh, economic and regional cooperation uh, in the Balkan region to help them with the accession process. The second important uh, challenge is the rule of law, which is now at the heart uh, of the accession process, the so-called chapters 23 and 24, which focus on judicial, uh, the judicial aspects, and here the main problem remains uh, the lack of independence of the judiciary, the uh, involvement of uh, politics in the judicial uh, process, uh, and uh, also uh, the problem of the very weak, uh, again, fight against organized crime and corruption, and the need for a much more determined effort to eliminate uh, corruption, which still remains at high level, as well as organized crime. There is also the issue of abuse, of preventive detention in a number of countries. If you look at those who are detained very often purely for political reasons, Macedonia is an unfortunate example in this respect, uh, and again the uh, selective approach in uh, launching of judicial proceedings against uh, individuals very often uh, under the, uh, uh, under the uh, charge of uh, fraud or abuse of public office, but it usually is uh, purely because those individuals have been critical of the uh, government uh, of the day. 
The third important uh, challenge is strengthening the functioning of the institutions guaranteeing democracy. Of course, the parliament uh, is the main uh, issue and the fact that in several uh, countries there is still uh, a lack of effective political dialogue. It's so difficult, I remember in my own time in Macedonia, to get the politicians to uh, learn to pick up the phone and to talk to each other and to try to resolve differences. Unfortunately, party interests uh, get uh, in the way, uh, and so as we've seen also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the lack of a political consensus driving the national uh, policies uh, of, uh, the, of the country. Uh, in the same context, of course, uh, there is the problem of very politicized public administration uh, and uh, a, um, uh, the need for a much greater involvement, uh, a more inclusiveness, I would say, in the reform process. And by that I mean bringing in uh, all the political parties, civil society, so much more open debate about policy uh, which doesn't exist at the moment, and similarly a more inclusive approach in the enlargement process. Slovenia is an excellent model in terms of inclusive approach in the enlargement because it set up a core negotiating group which represented all the main factors in society and really it, it ensured that whatever Slovenia was proposing in the negotiating process uh, had the full backing of the entire country and so made the voice of Slovenia much stronger. And I understand that Montenegro has followed now the same approach in its own process. The fourth challenge, of course, is fundamental rights. Uh, and the fact that there are still uh, a lot of examples of uh, discrimination uh, against uh, the Roma community, discrimination on the basis of ethnic uh, origin, a discrimination against the gay and lesbian community, uh, and uh, uh, the need for uh, the institutions that are often established to deal with this, that they should have effective funding, proper resources, that they can really ensure that uh, non-discrimination uh, is uh, fully respective of the EU standards. And in the same chapter, of course, there is the issue of media. And there... Sadly, uh, all the international media watchdogs uh, uh, plus the uh, international institutions like the OSCE, which has a, a, a special representative for the freedom of the media, are unanimous in saying that there has been very serious backtracking in the Balkans regarding uh, freedom of the media and respect for the independence uh, of the media and that this needs to be uh, addressed uh, very uh, in a very more effective uh, way. And it's not just a question of legislation, uh, because there is discussion in some countries about legislation. It's a question of changing the mindset, changing the mentality. And the fifth uh, major challenge set out in the enlargement package uh, for the countries is bilateral issues and in overcoming the legacy of the past. Bilateral issues, uh, which, of course, the Balkans uh, have produced more uh, bilateral problems, I think, than uh, the region can absorb because of its history. But we have some very positive examples also how these can be resolved. And perhaps the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia is the best example that if they put their minds to it, and, it, of course, it was brokered by the European Union, by Lady Ashton, uh, but success can be achieved. And we mustn't forget that these are uh, two uh, countries who uh, were sworn enemies, uh, but nevertheless getting them together to reach uh, an agreement uh, and enable the both to uh, move forward uh, shows that if there is a will, it can be done. But, of course, there are other intractable interethnic uh, issues uh, linking with constitutional issues, such as in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and uh, you also have uh, the uh, problem of Macedonia and Greece over the name issue. And the legacy of the past, of course, is a challenge which doesn't, is not particular to the Balkans, but uh, is facing many post-conflict societies. South Africa is probably the best example 
of how to address uh, the legacy of the past and how to promote a policy of reconciliation. Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa is probably the best example of rec successful reconciliation process. Northern Ireland still has to uh, face that challenge and the Balkans even more. But there are some uh, local um, initiatives to try to overcome uh, that. So if we look at the record uh, over uh, the, uh, the past uh, year uh, and also uh, some of the uh, proposals that the European Commission has included in uh, this year's package, the momentum is uh, nevertheless there. Uh, with Turkey, admittedly, it's a modest uh, step, but there has been the opening of a new uh, chapter uh, in the negotiations focusing on regional policy, so momentum moving, the bicycle is turning very, very slowly, but at least it's moving. In uh, Montenegro, we have the negotiations that are ongoing uh, and the process is in place, uh, and uh, this demonstrates, I think, the importance uh, of once negotiations are in place, the mechanism uh, of trying to make sure that all the reforms stay on track. Serbia, uh, we expect uh, negotiations, formal negotiations, to start uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, already the so-called screening process, which is a technical uh, process whereby all the legis legislation of a given country is assessed to see whether it is compatible with the EU, that is already uh, underway. Kosovo, the negotiations for the Stabilization Association Agreement, which is sort of the first step, it's the parlor before you get into the kitchen, so to speak, uh, is already uh, underway, was started just uh, a few weeks ago. And for Albania, which went through uh, electoral process this year, which was, uh, okay, there were a few uh, problems, but nevertheless, generally, the impression was uh, of a smooth transition uh, after the elections uh, and uh, the commission on that basis has decided to recommend that Albania be granted candidate status uh, at the uh, December uh, Council of the uh, European Union, and this will uh, give uh, an added incentive to uh, Albania, su such a decision, to uh, pursue uh, reforms in those areas where there are still a lot of weaknesses, such as uh, corruption, organized crime, etc. There are two black holes, I would say, in this scenario. Uh, and one of them is Bosnia-Herzegovina that I mentioned. And there, the language of the European Commission's report is quite stark. Uh, the process is at a standstill. Uh, and it does reflect uh, the situation and the seemingly uh, impossible, uh, impossibility of the leaders to set aside their own uh, interests and to come forward with consensus approach. Uh, and it is this lack of political consensus that has uh, resulted in the country really uh, not moving forward as it should. And next year there will be elections in Bosnia-Herzegovina, so there's a major challenge. And the question arises what to do. How uh, should the EU, EU react? Should it be a more... Uh, effective on the ground, uh, should it uh, be more proactive uh, uh, like uh, occurred in Serbia and Kosovo, etc. The second black hole, sadly, uh, is Macedonia. And even though uh, the Commission, uh, for the fifth time, recommended that negotiations to start, uh, you will recall that uh, uh, in 2009, uh, on the basis of good progress during that year, that was a good, I always call it a good vintage year, because really progress was, was made, and Neve, who's there, was working with me and, and knows uh, how difficult it was, but we felt that the country was making progress, and a recommendation for opening negotiations made in 2009. That has been repeated five times, uh, and... Uh, the negotiations have not yet opened. The situation in the country uh, is uh, extremely serious, and I would say personally that uh, the uh, danger of instability is more real than in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
uh, and uh, we saw uh, the events of the 24th of December uh, in the parliament in uh, Skopje when the, all the opposition uh, members of parliament and the media were physically uh, forced out of the uh, parliament chamber. Uh, it was quite a dramatic uh, situation and dramatic scenes which reflected uh, the total lack of a political consensus, of political dialogue, and the totally polarized situation in the country. In addition to that, public administration continues to be extremely politicized, and the government control over the electoral process is unfortunately very real. And the official report of the OSCE spoke of allegations of voter intimidation uh, and misuse of state funds for electoral campaign. Uh, and if you look at this year's progress report, you will see also uh, references to the uh, political interference in the judiciary, selective approach in the judicial process, as well, of course, as the lack uh, of a media freedom. And all of this has created a climate of fear uh, in society. And I travel there regularly. And it's very sad to see that uh, independent-minded uh, organization, civil society, uh, sim simply uh, adopt a self-censorship approach because they are, are afraid of being the subject of harassment or intimidation. In addition to that, of course, there is the name issue, uh, which uh, is, on the one hand, it's a very convenient excuse for the prime minister uh, to, of the day and the government to say that all the problems of Macedonia are because of the name issue. Uh, and it is true that uh, the longer this name issue continues, uh, the more uh, serious the situation gets, and also the more it strengthens the uh, current government's populist uh, agenda in the country. So the message uh, really is that this name issue needs to be resolved sooner rather than later. It has gone on for far too long. But of course, the only way it can be resolved is if there is a dialogue between the two sides, if they sit down to talk. We all know uh, the difficulties uh, of reaching agreement uh, from Northern Ireland if both sides don't sit down and talk. And the general impression is at the moment that Greece is reluctant to engage uh, in uh, a dialogue. Uh, and uh, this is very difficult to, to uh, understand uh, because it means uh, that the overall situation there is uh, going to deteriorate. Uh, and um, so there is no other alternative to engagement between the, both sides on the basis of the UN mediation. At the moment, uh, the mediation is uh, limited to uh, the odd meeting every three or four months between the two chief negotiators, but it's very perfunctory uh, and, and nothing happens. There needs to be a much more determined effort, uh, and I do believe that member states also must exert more pressure on Greece uh, and uh, use the opportunity of its presidency of the EU for the first six months of next year to uh, really uh, resolve this issue uh, once uh, and for all. In conclusion, just a few um, words on possible reforms in the enlargement. Next year is uh, an interesting opportunity because there'll be a new parliament, a new commission, a new high representative, uh, and so it's always a good moment to review uh, to be self-critical and to see what uh, lessons we can learn from the past uh, and how to improve it. And uh, while definitely uh, the overall record of enlargement, as I said at the very beginning, is very positive, nevertheless, there is no doubt that there are ways that we can improve that. Certainly, I think there needs the European Union and the European Commission in particular needs to find ways of using its leverage more effectively. It was effective in Serbia and Kosovo, uh, but in other places, not as much. So there needs to be more consistency, more leverage, a more effective way of using that leverage. It's easier said than done, of course. 
but nevertheless, uh, there are uh, definitely ways that can strengthen uh, the European Union's role. Also, in this whole debate about how to strengthen the EU's role as a peacemaker, uh, as a mediator, uh, at the moment, the uh, OSCE, uh, is one of its principal uh, mandates is uh, mediation, but uh, it needs or very often support uh, from the European Union, from the UN, and all of this can together could make really an important, uh, have an important impact uh, in, in, in the future uh, and to give a more effective role for the European Union foreign policy. I would also say that the European Commission needs to preserve uh, rigorously uh, the objectivity for which it was always uh, known uh, in its annual assessments. There is an impression sometimes that the Commission has a tendency to tailor its assessments to suit the policy objective. And this is, I think, uh, not uh, very conducive uh, to the end result. Uh, for example, uh, at the moment, uh, the trigger for the uh, member states to determine whether negotiations should start is the phrase, the country sufficiently meets the political criteria. But as we have seen, there are some countries who are there where there is a recommendation for opening negotiations, but who do not meet the political criteria. Uh, Macedonia is, is a case in point. So therefore, there needs to be perhaps other uh, other triggers, and I would say that one should be the issue of stability. If, as in the case of Macedonia, there has been efforts at reforms in several areas, there has been a recommendation for opening negotiations, but for many reasons it's not possible, I do believe that the only way that the Macedonian situation can be resolved is for negotiations to start, because then you lock that country into a process uh, whereby it's, not, it's impossible uh, for the country to go off track. If it does, then of course the negotiations are suspended. So that's a strong leverage that the European uh, Union has. So uh, locking a country into the negotiating process ensures that the reform process remains on track. And I, I do believe that there needs to be some internal uh, discussions in the European Commission uh, on on that and how to how to improve. There also needs to be, I think, a much greater focus on how to enhance the cooperation between the European Union and other actors, such as the OSCE and the Council of Europe, who have proven expertise in areas where the European Union doesn't have Me media, for example, education. Uh, and uh, all the issues dealing with uh, ethnic minorities. The European Union does not have a, a key, as it's called, established legislation on, on minorities. Council of Europe uh, and the OSCE have uh, a lot of expertise, so there needs to be more effort to cooperate, uh, not only at headquarters, but particularly uh, out in the field between the OSCE uh, uh, Council of Europe and the EU to make more effective uh, the, the role uh, of these organizations on the ground and also to avoid what we call forum shopping of the host country who might see nuances between the EU and the OSCE, for example, in the areas of media or education and plays on that uh, for its own advantage. And the final important area where I believe the, there should be more focus is to uh, involve civil society much more uh, in the process uh, and uh, encouraging that uh, not just through funding but also to get uh, those countries uh, that, like the ones I mentioned to involve civil society much more in the policy development as well as the, in the accession process. Uh, and this also has an important role in terms of, of resolving internal disputes, resolving conflicts, internal, interethnic, intra, uh, in, within the, a given state or between states. And again, there the OSCE uh, has uh, a lot of expertise uh, in uh, how to, and the EU, I think, needs to develop that, how to bring in civil society much more uh, into that process because this helps then 
to ensure uh, greater acceptance of whatever is agreed, and we've seen it in Northern Ireland. Uh, if you bring in civil society at the earliest possible stage, you can ensure much greater acceptance of whatever is agreed uh, at the national or regional uh, level. And uh, I firmly believe that uh, the contribution from civil society uh, can play a, a very, very constructive role. And very often civil society is way ahead of the politicians uh, and uh, can act as a, as a control uh, over them. But of course in some countries it's difficult because they are themselves controlled. So I have uh, gone longer than my uh, 20 minutes, I apologize. But uh, I look forward to uh, questions. Thank you very much.